In this section, we're going to talk, we'll discuss the Kirchhoff voltage and current laws, and in the end, we'll also talk about electric power. The Kirchhoff voltage law, abbreviated with KVL, is one of the most important laws that you need to know in order to solve electronic circuit. As indicated on the side here, this is the definition of uh, the Kirchhoff voltage law, and it basically says that the sum of all the voltage in a loop must be equal to zero. What is a loop? A loop is any path traced from one point in the circuit around other points in the circuit and then back to the initial point. So sim very simple definition. How do you actually implement that practically speaking? So I'm just gonna show you very simply with an example on the right. So you see here a simple circuit. It's actually the most complicated circuit we have seen so far. We have three components. We have a battery, we have two resistors, R1, R2. Now we don't know exactly what is the value of the resistor and that is not really important. We know that the voltage of the battery is equal to 5 volt, and we know that the voltage across one resistor is equal to 3 volts. Now, what is the voltage across the resistor R2? Probably very simple to understand what is the voltage at that point, but uh, some circuit might be more complicated than others, and so it is important to understand what is sort of a formal procedure to follow to make sure your result is always correct. It's pretty simple to implement. So what you do, let me take uh, my green pen, is that you identify the loop. Here we only have one loop, so there's no doubt. You pick a random direction for the voltages. That is already done. And when I see a random direction, I mean apply a random orientation for the arrow of the voltage. Like in this case, we know, okay, the 5 volt is in this direction, so the potential is higher here than here. We know that 3 volt is in this direction. V2, we don't know yet what is the direction of the voltage. It could actually be directed the other way around. It doesn't matter. I decide that the voltage most likely is directed in this direction. So there is a higher potential here than here. So that is totally random. Then we you assign the direction of the loop. So you have this loop. You just write a circle here and you decide, let's use this direction as a convention. Any direction is fine. You can be clockwise or counterclockwise and now all you're gonna do is that you're gonna write you're gonna sum all these voltages together and the one that goes with the same direction of the circle are gonna be positive the one that going with the direction opposite of the circle they're gonna be negative and the total sum has to be equal to zero so in this case five it's going in the same direction of the circle so I'm just gonna write plus five now when I get here, 3 is the opposite of the circle, so minus 3 volts. V2, I don't know what is the value, but I can clearly see that it's going in the opposite direction of this arbitrary orientation. So minus V2, and now we completed the circle, so equals 0. Now this equation can be solved, I will give very easily the solution, which is V2 is equal to 2 volts. Easy, right? The example that we have looked at before, it's a very simple one because clearly there is just one loop in the whole circuit. If you consider a more complicated one, like this one on the right, there could be many more loops here. The Kirchhoff voltage law applies for any loop that you can possibly choose. That will always be true. So in this example, that is one loop, it's already highlighted, but let me take a different color, a blue for example. This is another loop, this is also another loop, you can also choose a loop that works like this or you can also choose a loop that does something like this any loop is, is a fair game you can choose any loop you want and if you apply the Kirchhoff voltage law the way that I just explained you will always be able to solve the circuit another very important law of electronics is the Kirchhoff kernel law which is abbreviated often with KCL. Here's the definition of the law. The algebraic sum of all currents entering and exiting a node must be equal to zero. A node is any point on a circuit where two or more circuit elements meet. In this example on the right, we have two nodes, A and B. And most of the time, people use a dot to represent a node. The procedure to calculate all the value of the currents is very simple you first define an arbitrary direction for the currents that you don't know. In this example, we already been told what is the value of this current and the direction of the current. We already been told the direction and the, and the value of this other current. 
We don't know the value of the candle in this branch of the circuit. So as far as we can tell, the candle could be going down or up. We don't know that yet. So what we have to do is to apply an arbitrary direction. It doesn't matter what you pick. If you pick the right direction, you will get a positive number as a result. If you get a negative number, you knew that the direction was the opposite. Now, to calculate the current i, the missing one, you just apply this, this simple rule. So you take a certain node, you could take A or B, in this example, they are exactly the same, let's take A. So if you look at A, this current, this 1 amp current is entering A, so we can write plus 1 amp. The 0.3 amp current is leaving the node, so we can write minus 0.3 amp. And the current high that we're trying to find is entering the node, so it's plus I, all equal to 0. It's very simple to solve this equation, I is equal to minus 0.7 amp. So the fact that the current is negative means that the real direction of the current is actually the opposite, which completely makes sense. If you think about it, you have 1 amp going into this node, and if 0.3 amp are going down, 0.7 amp have to be going in the other direction. The Kirchhoff current law is a representation of the principle of conservation of charge. It simply means that you cannot you know, destroy or create charges out of nothing. So if I tell you that there are three charges going into the node in this direction, and I'm also telling you that there are two charges going in this other direction, you can be sure that you're going to have one charge going in this other direction. Otherwise, if that wasn't the case, that would mean that some charge somehow disappeared, or you create some charge out of nothing, which is impossible. I want to show you that it doesn't matter which node you choose, ultimately there is only one solution for the current in the circuit. So let's do the same calculation using node B instead of node A. So now the 1 amp current is obviously coming out of it, so it's minus 1 amp. The 0.3 current is coming inside of it, so 0.3 amp. And the current I that we're trying to find is leaving the node, so it's minus I is equal to 0. So as you can see, we get exactly the same results. I is equal to minus 0.7 amp. And that has to be the case. Otherwise, that means we have committed some mistake in the previous calculation or in this calculation. In this lesson, we're going to talk about voltage dividers. Voltage divider in the simplest form is simply made of two resistors in series. And the goal of the voltage divider is to take a larger voltage which could be battery voltage in this case, or any other voltage, and divide the large voltage into different smaller voltages, like in this case, V2 and V1. And all the output voltages, obviously, are a fraction of the input voltage accordingly to the Kirchhoff voltage law. The value of V1 and V2, it's easy to calculate. From the Kirchhoff voltage law, we know that the sum of V1 and V2 has to be equal to VBAT. So VBAT is equal to V1 plus V2. And in order to calculate the value of V1 and V2, we can simply do the following. So we remember that the equivalent series resistance of R1 and R2 is equal to the sum of R1 and R2. So RS, we can call it, is R1 plus R2. Then we calculate the current that is going through the series of these two resistors, just like this. And the value of the current will be equal to the V baht divided by R1 plus R2, which is the series resistance. And then finally, we have the current going through the two resistors, so we should be able to calculate the two final voltages. So the two final results, V1, will be equal to V bit instead of the bat, just for short, R1, R1 plus R2, and V2 is equal to Vb, R2, R1 plus R2. The same idea can be extended for a larger number of resistors. So if you have your supply here, but instead of having only two resistors, you have four of them, now, as a result, you're going to have four voltages that you, that you can pick. This resistor would be R1, R2, 
a three or four this one I call it V in this time and now you're gonna have V1, V2, V3 and V4 the sum of these resistor of these voltages is gonna be equal to V in again for the Kirchhoff voltage law and you can use a generic equation to calculate the, the voltage across each one of the resistor so the voltage so the Vx for the voltage across any generic resistor X will be equal to Rx, so the value of the resistor, divided by the sum, so R1 plus R2 plus Rn, so all the resistors that you have in the voltage divider, obviously multiplied by the input voltage. So this equation gives you an idea of how things go and the fact that the voltage across one resistor compared to the other is uh, proportional to how bigger is the resistance of the resistor compared to the other resistor in the voltage divider. For example, if you have a voltage divider made just with two resistors and the resistors are the same, the voltage will be equally split between the two resistors. If you have three resistors that are all the same, you will have one third of the voltage on each of the resistors and so on. Instead, if you have, for example, a resistor that is 10 times as bigger than, as the other and you have only two resistors, you will have that one eleventh of the voltage will go on the smaller resistor and 10 eleventh of the voltage will go to, with the larger resistor. Voltage dividers can be made using a different number of resistors. You start with a minimum value, which is 2, but then you can have 4, 3, 5, 10, as, as many as you want in principle. The idea is that by increasing the number of resistors, you get a higher number of output voltages. Now, I want to make a few comments on this. First of all, remember that the total sum of all the voltages on the resistors is going to be equal to the input voltage. So if you increase the number of resistors too much, you're just going to get very, very tiny voltages. Also, these voltages are going to be not very accurate. The resistor themselves uh, are not very accurate. When we say the resistor is one kilo ohm, uh, usually when you actually buy a component, it will come with a certain tolerance, for example, plus minus 5%. It also changes with temperature a little bit. If you're trying to just divide the voltage roughly by two, that is fine, you can use a voltage divider. But if you're trying to get very precise values of voltages, and many of them, then you're gonna get quite surprising results. I want to revisit the equation for a voltage divider a little bit because when we calculated it, we made a bigger assumption, a big unspoken assumption that is important to highlight because it really determines whether your circuit will work or not. The assumption that we made is that R1 and R2 or whatever, how many resistors you use for your voltage divider are in series with each other. So they are crossed by the same current. So for this example here, what that means is that the current given or taken by the central terminal is equal to zero. It doesn't matter what happened at this terminal or at this terminal, the one at the very top and the one at the very bottom can have as much current as they want because they are connected straight to a battery. So the battery will guarantee that the voltage stays the same, but the voltage in the central terminal is supposed to be zero. If that is not equal to zero, your equation is not valid anymore. You might wonder, well, is it that a problem? We'll just have to calculate a different equation. Well, let me give you an example. Let's say most of the time, the current in the central tower will be different to zero because you're not using the voltage divider simply to create that V2 voltage, but your plan is actually to use that V2 voltage to do something. For example, let's say you have a, a battery voltage that is four volts and it's too high for your chip. So you have a chip that really needs 1.8 volt to work. So now you do your math uh, to size R1 and R2 and then you find out what is the value that you need to get 1.8 volt. After you've done that, you complete your circuit by connecting your chip. So the chips uh, usually they always want to be connected to ground. So they have a ground terminal and then they have another pin which is called DCC or VDD which is the power supply. So now you connect it. The problem now is that this chip in order to work will, will need a current that is different than zero. If this current were to be constant, then we you could probably live with it because you will be able to redo a different equation considering that some current is stolen from R1 by this integrated circuit. And then you do you will have a, a new revised equation that tell you what is the value of R1 and R2 that you need to have to have 1.8 volts. That we say we want to have here. The problem with that is that chips, circuit, but in general, pretty much almost anything you can connect there. Problem is that the current that they need in order to work usually changes with time. It's not constant. 
you know, if you look at an integrated circuit, in particular a digital one, the current that you need during the time will be something like this. It will, it will keep changing really fast. It will go from zero when the chip is not doing anything to a really high current when the, when the circuit is uh, like switching and, and doing operation. And the problem with that is that then you will have variable voltage across V2 and uh, it's going to be really, really, really hard to guarantee that that voltage will stay equal to the desired 1.8 volt. Well, how can you solve the problem of um, a voltage divider where the central tap is actually using some current? Well, there are two ways to approach this. So the first way is don't use VD, the voltage divider, if the current is different than zero. <laughs> so pretty much, this doesn't tell you much, but what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that use the voltage divider only in cases where the current and the central tap is, is zero. So there are cases where that is true. For example, if you connect that to an input pin of a digital chip, the input pin most likely will have a practically zero current. So in that case, uh, the voltage divider will work. Or for example, if you connect it to a comparator or, you know, there are kind of applica some application that really truly requires zero current. Or for example, if you really your goal is just to generate that voltage V2 for, I don't know, educational purposes. And the only thing you're going to do with it is just to connect a multimeter between the two terminals. So instead of having uh, an IC here, you're just going to connect a multimeter to measure the voltage. Then uh, the current is, is basically zero. The second thing that you can do to a working voltage divider is to make sure that the I bias is much bigger than the max of the absolute of I load. Now what I mean with that is the following. So the I load is the current that you need to have going into your load in order to do something with it. As I said before, you're most likely using a voltage divider to generate an intermediate voltage from the battery voltage and you want to connect a load there. Connect a device, which could be a resistor, a chip, something that needs that voltage in order to work. So if we call this load, the current that this device needs is called I load. This current could be positive, negative. We cannot make a, an assumption now because we don't know what the load looks like. But we have to be able somehow to calculate what is the maximum absolute value that the current will ever had either positive or negative, we, we need to know what it is. And if we can tell uh, what the value of the, the maximum value of the current, uh, the current is, we can make sure that that is much smaller than I bias. And when I say much smaller, I mean at least 100 times smaller. So the I bias is the following. So the I bias is the current that goes through, actually let me represent it like this, that goes through R1 and R2. So. Uh, obviously, the current that goes in R1 and R2 is not exactly the same, but if we can assume that I load is much, much smaller than R bias, than the current going in R1, then the current going in R2 is going to be pretty much the same as R1, because from the Kirchhoff current law, you know that the current in R2 is equal to the current in R1 minus I load in this case. So if it's much smaller, it's practically equivalent to zero. So we can say that the current in R1 and R2 is the same. It's practically as if they were in series. And the value of the current across them will be simply given by V bat divided by R1 plus R2. So if that is the case, the equation that we calculated before still doesn't really apply mathematically, it's not perfect anymore. But because the amount of current that the load will steal from the voltage divider is really tiny compared to the one going down through the voltage divider, the so-called I bias, then we can pretty much neglect it. And we can say that the voltage V2 will pretty much always gonna be around the value that we designed the voltage divider for. If you look at this equation here that we calculated for Vx, uh, but in general, if you think about the relationship for these two, for V2, V2 is equal to V bat R2 divided R1 plus R2. So you will notice something very interesting. So the voltage divider is pretty much agnostic on the absolute value of the resistance. All the voltage divider care is about the relative value of the resistance. In this case, if R1 is equal to R2, you're always gonna have the V2 is equal to half V bat. Now, that means that R1 and R2 could be equal to one ohm. Uh, they could be one kilo ohm, uh, one mega ohm, or 10 mega ohm, or whatever you want. You still get the same result. 
the reality, the practice of engineering here uh, tells you that you can really choose any value of resistance that you want because while that will mathematically work, it will have some serious limitation of your real circuit. You can choose value of resistor that are either too small or too big. If you choose a value of the resistor that's too small, you're going to have a big bias current going through your voltage divider. And that is generally undesirable for several reasons. First of all, if this voltage generator is really a battery, you're going to be draining the battery very quickly for no reason. Secondly, having a pretty big current, uh, most likely it's going to mean that you have a big power dissipated on the resistors. Remember that the power dissipated is square of the current multiplied by the resistor and that means that your resistor will have to be pretty fat because otherwise it will heat up quite a bit and it could even, could even burn. On the other hand, you also don't want to choose a value of resistance that's too high. First of all, very high value of resistance is difficult to find and in addition to that, if you choose a value of resistance that's too high, the problem with that is that you're going to have a very, very, very uh, tiny, tiny bias current going through your voltage divider because remember that the I bias is roughly equal to V bar divided by R1 plus R2 in this example. So if R1 and R2 are too big, the I bias would be very small. And if the I bias is really small, first of all, you're very likely not respecting condition number two, which means that you really have to have zero current from the central tap for this voltage divider to work. And secondly, even if you really have zero voltage, the problem is uh, you're always going to have some noise injected in your circuit by other appliances, other electronic tools nearby. For example, if you have a phone or things like that. So they will inject voltage and current in your circuit. And you want a voltage divider to be somewhat solid and robust. And in order to do so, you want decently sized current to go through it. So that even if there is some external factor, inject a little perturbation, overall your results stay the same. So you want this current to be somewhat significant. So usually the rule of the thumb is to use a value of resistors in the range of kilo ohm, for example 10 kilo ohm, 5 kilo ohm, up to I don't know 100 kilo ohm max kind of, of value. But then again uh, every circuit is a different story. If you really need to use this voltage divider but your I load is insignificant then you should uh, use a smaller value of resistor. Voltage divider is still not really a good way to get a precise reference voltage. Uh, though this might be stated here, I'm also saying that there are serious limitations. So as I highlighted before, resistors have tolerance, so they, they change their value uh, within a certain random range that you never know, and the value of the resistance also change with the temperature, so you can't fully rely on them. Secondly, it's very quick to see that if you really want to use, have any significant load current here, in order to have a stable voltage, you will really have to use very low resistor values and that is really undesirable because you will end up consuming a lot of current. The voltage divider is good to generate reference voltage only when the current from the load is really, really tiny and when you don't really don't need to have a precise voltage to begin with, but you just roughly have to have, let's say, half of the input voltage, something like that. Another important assumption that we made that I have not discussed yet on the voltage divider is that the input voltage is constant. That might be the case, depending on your circuit, but most of the time that is not the case. In particular, if you connect as an input voltage a battery like I'm assuming here. The voltage battery is changing quite a bit during the operation. The voltage at 100% charge is much different than a voltage at 50% charge for a battery. And so you'll have to be very careful when you design a voltage divider to keep into account that the input voltage might be changing as well. So if your goal of your voltage divider was to generate a voltage that is half the battery voltage, then it doesn't matter that the battery is changing. If you have R1 equal to R2, for example, you're always going to have the output being equal to half the input voltage. But if your goal was to generate an exact value of the voltage, then you're going to be in trouble because as your input voltage is changing over time, so is your output voltages. If you need something precise, stable, something for example used to actually supply the voltage to a chip, then you will very likely use something else.
Needless to say that a similar approach can be used to find the value of the current in voltage dividers with more than two branches. These equations that we have just calculated are similar to the one of the voltage divider, but there is a fundamental difference. If we had a voltage divider composed by two resistors, R1 and R2, and we wanted to calculate the percentage of Vbat falling on R1, the results would have been R1 over R1 plus R2. In the case of the current divider, instead, the portion of Vbat going into R1 is R2 divided by R1 plus R2. You see the difference? In the case of the voltage, we put a numerator, the resistor whose voltage drop we are calculating. While in the case of the current, we put the other resistor. You see here we are calculating I1 over I bat, and the result is R2 divided by the sum of the resistor. And at the same time, when we want to calculate the current in I2, we have R1 divided by the sum of the resistor. This is the opposite of what you get if you are calculating the voltage over this resistor in a voltage divider. This might seem strange, but it's very intuitive. In the voltage divider, for the same current, a high resistor takes a larger portion of the input voltage, while in the case of the current divider, for the same voltage, the higher the other resistor, the higher is the portion of the current that will prefer to flow in the resistor under study. Current dividers work well when their different branches are truly in parallel with each other. If you were to connect anything in series to any of the resistors, like this, this little box in series to R2, the equations of the current divider that we have just calculated won't be mathematically correct anymore. But it will still be okay as long as the voltage drop across this new element is much smaller than Vbat. I want to spend a few more words on the concept of the path of least resistance. As we've seen before, the current tends to use the path where the resistance is the least. We can see an example of this in the two equations that we have just calculated. These ones. Assume for a minute that R1 is two times as big as R2. So, R1 equal 2 times R2. If we replace R1 in both this equation, we get that I1 is equal to I bat divided by 3 and I2 is equal to I bat 
Or in the case of the hydraulic circuit, the second tube is replaced by an infinitely large tube. In this case, the equation tells us that no current will flow into R1 and that all the current will go into R2. A short circuit will therefore deprive the circuit of all of its current and cause a large amount of current to concentrate into a tiny wire. R1 will be zero and I2 will be equal to I bat. Note that not only I2 will be equal to I bat, but if you consider this specific circuit, the value of I bat will also become infinite because now you are applying a voltage of a certain value, V bat, across a resistor equal to zero. So if you use Ohm's law, you can calculate that the current will become infinite. In real circuits, the current cannot really become infinite, but it will definitely become really large. That is why short circuits are so dangerous. They generate large current in small areas, and they often not only prevent the circuit from working as intended, but they can also start a fire and destroy the circuit. In this lesson, we will talk about a very important principle of electronics, the superposition principle. This principle will help us to solve more complicated circuits. As indicated here, the principle says that for a linear circuit, the net response caused by two or more generators is equivalent to the sum of the responses that would have been caused by individual generators. Let's first define what is a linear circuit. A linear circuit is a circuit composed by linear components, such as resistors, capacitors, and inductors, plus voltage and current sources. For instance, the circuit on the left is a linear circuit, because it is entirely made of resistors, voltage sources, and current sources. Let's imagine that we want to calculate the value of the voltage V3 on the resistor R3. This seems quite a complicated endeavor, as more than one generator is acting on the circuit and will somewhat influence the outcome. How can we solve this problem? Here is where the superposition principle comes to save the day. The superposition principle tells us that, as long as the circuit is linear, one does not need to tackle the whole thing at once but the final result can be computed as the sum of the effects of the individual generators. On the right of the slide, I indicated a procedure one must follow to solve the circuit. Step 1. Turn off all generators but one and compute its effect on the desired node. Let's start by calculating the effect of VA. That means that we have to turn off IB and BC. How do we do that? Well, IB is a current source, so its job is to produce a current. Turning it off means setting the current to zero. A net, where the current is zero, is indistinguishable from an open circuit. So turning off a current generator is equivalent to removing it from the circuit and leaving the net open. VC is a voltage source. Its job is to generate a voltage. Turning it off means setting the voltage to zero. A component that, no matter the current, always has a voltage drop of zero volt is indistinguishable from a wire. So turning off a voltage generator is equivalent to replacing it with a wire. So we are shorting VC out. Now that we have turned off IB and VC, we are left with a circuit with only one generator and a few resistors. This circuit is simple to solve. We recognize that R2 and R3 are in parallel and that their parallel will generate a voltage divided with R1. So the contribution of VA to V3, a quantity that we can call V3A, will be equal to VA multiplied by R2 parallel R3 divided by R1 plus R2 parallel R3. Now, that the calculation of the contribute of one of the generators is complete, we can move on to the next one till we have considered 
all the generators in the circuit. At the end of the procedure, the final results for V3 will be given by the sum of each of the contributes. So V3 will be equal to V3A plus V3B plus V3C. Let's see an example. We consider the same circuit as before, but now we have assigned value to the components. The resistor resistance is 1 ohm, VA is plus 3 volts, IB is 3 amps in this direction, and VC is minus 1.5 volt. The incognita is still V3, the voltage across R3. On the right of the slide, I represented how the circuit is transformed when one turns off all generators but one. In case A, the only generator left is what was called VA. In case B, we keep only
we must have an IB coming back on the other terminal. Hence, a block without a second terminal will make no and changes from person to person. For example, on the same project, the circuit designer will need to look at the detail of the schematic, while a system architect, who is looking at the design from a higher point of view, would prefer to start that you consider, both circuits will always generate the same voltage and current in it. The two circuits are completely different internally, but from the point of view of what you can see, looking from that port, the two circuits look identical. If a circuit has more than one port, it will have, in general, different Thevenin equivalents for each of its ports. Thevenin equivalents are useful, because they provide a level of abstraction and allow to ease the study and design of more complicated circuits. For instance, say that you want to connect not just a load, but another circuit to this port of this network, and you're wondering how the two circuits will work together. Wouldn't it be easier by replacing the first circuit with the Thevenin equivalent? Do you really need to know how all the voltages and currents inside the circuit move in order to determine how the circuit will interact from that port? The answer to this question is often no. Let me give you another perhaps silly example from daily life. To use a computer, do you need to know all the intricacies of the internal design? Do you need to know the model of the CPU, how much RAM it has, and how many resistors are used in its circuits? The answer is no. 
The operating system and your input devices like the keyboard and the mouse provide a level of abstraction and allow you to effectively move electrons around inside of your computer and all over the world via the internet without having to know how all of that works. Without this level of abstraction between internal circuit and the user, nearly no one will be able to use a PC. Alright, now the question is, how do you find the Thevenin equivalent of a circuit? Well, there is a procedure that you have to follow that is indicated here. Step 1. Disconnect the load. The Thevenin equivalent is meant to represent the circuit, the rest of the circuit, so the load cannot be part of it. So in this case, we will just eliminate this. Step number two, use the superposition principle to find what is the open circuit voltage VOC at the port under consideration. That will be the value of the generator V equivalent. So in this case, we have eliminated the load. Let me delete it. And now we will use the superposition principle to find the value of the voltage here. And this voltage is called VOC, V open circuit, and that will be equivalent to the V equivalent of the Thevenin equivalent circuit. Step three, turn off all the generators in the circuit and simplify the network of the resistors till you're left with one resistor at the output port. That will be the value of the resistance in the Thevenin equivalent circuit. So in this case, we will turn off all the generator, which means the current source becomes open, the voltage sources become shorts, and then all we are left is a network of resistor. And we can do series and parallel until we simplify it all, and we are just left with one resistor between the two terminals of the port that we are considering. The value of that resistance will be equivalent to the R equivalent of the Thevenin equivalent circuit. Not too difficult, isn't it? Well, you could argue that this was quite some work and that one might better spend it just to solve the circuit and to find the voltage across the load. Well, if your goal is simply to find the voltage on the load once and you're sure that the load will never change, then you're right. Determining the happening equivalent of the circuit adds some overhead to an already complicated calculation. The Thevenin equivalent comes in handy, however, when the circuit can be used to drive different loads. Because once the Thevenin equivalent model is known, determining the voltage and the current on a new load is much, much easier than do the calculation all over again. Not only that, but the Thevenin equivalent circuit also allows you to compare how different circuits look from one of their port, something that is quite hard to do if the two circuits are complicated and significantly different. Let's look at an example. On the left, we have a fairly complex circuit with two generators and three resistors. And we want to find its Thevenin equivalent. Let's go step by step. Step one, remove the load. Done. Step two, find the value of V equivalent using the superposition principle. As you can see here, I've already done the work. On the left, I show the equivalent circuit when the current source is turned off. The circuit is a simple voltage divider that generates an output voltage of plus 2 volts. On the right, I did the opposite and turned off the voltage source instead. The resulting current divider generates a voltage drop equal to minus 1 volt. The value of the open circuit voltage VOC is therefore 1 volt. Step 3. 